We were talking about uh, Julie and how she can project, and you said that's only half. You oh, heard anything this is nothing. No, no, she's afraid of blowing the mic system in. <laughs> <laughs> you really do have uh, great control. And great Thank you, Mike. Thank enormous you. volume, too, when you want to use it. Thank you. The other if remarkable you... thing about her voice is she, her chest voice and her head voice are equally powerful. She can sing soprano up to a high B flat. She sings a duet from West Side Story in Side by Side by Sondheim. And at the same time, she can do any belt number you can give her. And it's just, she's just a remarkable voice, just remarkable. Because of all your stage experience and training, when somebody hands you a hand microphone, now you said moments ago you had never been on a show like this, ever, in no. England or in this country. No. Do you feel kind of restricted? Oh, and yes, very. I didn't really know what to do with it. Because you, you're so used to using your hands. Yes. I found it very false, very, very strange. <laughs> Do you love his songs, as, um, every, as all singers well, do? That's a loaded I, question. How can I, no, how can I say oh, this? He's sitting next to me, but he is the best. I mean, he's oh. just, just the best. He really is. You really write for actors as well as singers, and, uh, well, the, the stuff is, there, there isn't any better. Sorry I, to embarrass I've you, heard but... I've the best, <laughs> best singers in this country do things on stage about you that I'm sure you must have heard about. Like, uh, for instance, Frank, <laughs> Frank Sinatra, for instance. Oh, yeah. He does no, oh, that's... Oh, yeah. He yes. just raves about it. And it, he does it wonderfully well, too, doesn't he? Yes, and I've always wanted to meet him, and I keep waiting for to get a so chance to I. meet him. <laughs> now that you mention it. No, I've met him, but uh, you've never met the man? No, never met him, and uh, I'm always so flattered by what he says about me, and of course I adore the way he sings the song, because oh. he makes it so private. He understands the song. Yeah, not, it, mean, not, it means not many something do, to him. Do they? It, has, it has a personal meaning to him. I think. Okay. It's his kind of song, and he has impeccable music mm -hmm. taste, so mm -hmm. he should be flattered. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a list of some of the... Not only the lyrics, but you've written lyrics and lyrics and music mm -hmm. in many cases. Yeah. For the following shows, so that you're going to be as impressed as I was when this man walked on stage. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Gypsy. Do I hear a waltz? West Side Story. Company. Follies. Anyone can whistle. A little night music. And Pacific Overtures. Not Could there be one of those? Could there be one of those that you're most proud of, or, or a favorite? No, there, I, they, I have different favorites among them for different reasons. Um, I think Forum's the funniest show I ever saw. It's hysterical. Uh, it never fails to make me laugh. I've seen it, I guess, a couple of hundred times in various productions, and I've seen it in high schools. I've seen it at universities, <clears throat> I've seen it in amateur groups and stock groups, I've seen it in first-class revivals, and it always takes me by surprise. The, the, the libretto of that show, which is written by Bert Shevelov and Larry Gelbart, is, I think, the, absolutely the best farce ever written, and that includes the famous farces of the 19th century. When they wrote that, did they have Zero Mostel in mind? No, we had quite the reverse. We, there are five leading parts, uh, and all male, and what we intended it to be was what Bert called a scenario for vaudevillians. And our ideal cast consisted of Phil Silvers as Pseudalus, the leading man. And this ideal, remember, this is all in our heads, what we were dreaming. And Danny Kaye as Hysterium. Oh. And Buster Keaton as the old, old man. And Bert Lahr as the lecherous old man. And then Zero Mostel as the oily pimp, which is one of the funniest parts <laughs> in the thing. But a fellow who's scheming and selling, selling girls. And, of course, what happened was, ironically, when it all was over and it ended up in the movies, Phil Silvers had Zero Mostel's part, and Zero Mostel had Phil Silvers' Isn't part. Isn't that strange? And That's Hollywood, though. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. You have said something, and it's a quote I want to read. You've said that your main mission in writing songs uh, for the theater is to serve the show. Mm. Would you explain that to me, please? Well, I, I think that since Rodgers and Hammerstein came along, prior to, prior to the 1940s, when Rodgers and Hammerstein flowered, when Oklahoma was done, Shows were essentially collections of jokes, comedy scenes, star turns for everybody from Eddie Cantor to Marilyn Miller, and a lot of terrific songs by the Gershwins and by Rodgers and Hart. And Rodgers and Hammerstein revolutionized the theater essentially, although there had been story musicals before. They were the first ones to make them very popular, in which the plot and the story became what count. Well, you can look at some of the biggest hits over the last 25 years, and though there may be many of them without hit songs, Every one of them has a story that interests an audience. So what you have to do, I think, is service the story of the play. That's not necessarily a plot, but the characters, how you get involved. People really care about what they're being told, more than 
the songs. Because first of all, of course, the, uh, the source of popular songs now is no longer the theater or the movies. It's rock and, and, and yeah. groups. It used and to be that a song could be a hit prior to the show even hitting. Oh, absolutely. Way. And all, most of the biggest hits of the 20s, 30s, and 40s came from shows and movies. Starting in the 50s with the rock revolution, the split, the divergence occurred. And so you could get shows that were huge hits without any hit songs. Because what people essentially come to the theater to see now is what the entire evening is about. Exactly. And if they want to hear the songs, they can go buy a recording. Exactly. Is that why you've had so few hit songs? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't mean that as a no, it's, it's no. a fact. It's partly that. I don't even consider that a, a, a lack on my part. I'd love to have a lot of hit songs. But the fact is that, that I think maybe, I think the statistic is that in the last 10 years, there have only been three hit songs for musicals. That is, songs that have made the charts. And it's simply that that is not the source anymore. It depends on the interest. Send in the Clowns, which is my only really big hit song, uh, was around for two years before it became a hit. Yeah. It was made a hit first by Judy Collins doing a record of it that That's became right. a number one bestseller in England, not here, in England. Then it started to filter in over here. Sinatra heard it. He made a recording of it and started to do it in his concert acts. And then it became a hit. Yeah. Was that a surprise to you that that became oh, a hit? Absolutely flabbergasting. Flabbergasting. Because the whole song was written as a little throwaway number for Glynis explain, Johns. Explain explain the song. A lot of people uh, have a misconception about the song. When they hear it, they think it's about circus clowns and whatever. Oh, I see. No, it, it's a situation in the show A Little Night Music in which <clears throat> an, a middle-aged actress is trying to recapture a lost love of hers, a fellow who has since remarried and is not happily married, but doesn't realize that he's not happily married. And it's her job during the course of the story to make him realize that and to get him back. And she thinks she's done it. And they come together, and he reveals that he's still obsessed with this young bride that he's got. And she sings the song rather bitterly and about uh, how they are essentially the clowns. And that she says, isn't it rich? What she means is the irony. When I'm ready, a long time ago, I wasn't ready, and you were ready. Now I'm ready, and you're not ready, and we've missed each other. It's like Scarlet and Rhett in, in uh, Gone with the Wind. They're always missing each other. When one of them is ready to be married, the other isn't. Or when one of them is ready for the love affair, the other isn't. And it's ironic. Is it easier for you to write a song, and I guess you don't always have this luxury of knowing, is it easier knowing who's going to sing it? Oh, it would be wonderful if you could know your cast. There's a, there's a, as you probably know, a tradition in, in show business that uh, the, some of the best songs and some of the most popular ones were written out of town while the show was trying out of town. And everybody says, isn't it remarkable what pressure will do to a writer, how it'll make you write so well when you only have a few days in Boston or in Philadelphia to write? Well, the truth is, it's not the pressure. It's the fact that you see the cast and you know who you're writing for. I didn't write Send in the Clowns until we were in the middle of rehearsals, and I saw Glynis Johns doing that part. It wasn't enough just to know the script and know the scene. In fact, I had thought that a song didn't belong for the lady in that scene, and Hal Prince, the director, said, yes, it does, and I'll prove it to you. I'll direct the scene for you, and I'll show you how the impulse to sing is hers. And I went down to the rehearsal and saw it, and not only was the impulse the character's impulse, but it was Glynis Johns' impulse. And Glynis Johns has a very warm, but not trained voice and that's why the song is written in short phrases because she can't sustain notes that's it's yes, not in her voice yes. so it's isn't it rich pause pause catch your breath pause pause <laughs> are we a pair pause pause and the song is written for her voice that and the result is it's inimitable she that's why she does it so well and you'll see you know the movie elizabeth of little my music uh, 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 which is coming out this year uh elizabeth taylor sings it and everybody says elizabeth taylor sing well when I you hear her sing thing when i when you hear her sing it but taylor sing uh, i mean i don't want to hear her sing un bel d because she's not you know she's really not going to be able to appear at the met but that's probably but she is perfect and the voice is so warm and so touching and so true and musical that everybody's going to be astonished and also everybody's going to say oh she's not singing for herself it's and i'm else. here to swear in front of millions of people on television it is elizabeth taylor's voice and she's singing that's it and wild. it will really surprise people you, you say that you attribute a lot of your success to the late Oscar Hammerstein. Oh, yes. I, How did he help you? Well, he really literally taught me everything I know, and mostly in one afternoon. When I was 15 years old, I'd written a show for school, and he and his partner, Richard Rogers, were not only in the... In the uh, uh, they were not only writing musicals in those days, they were producing other people's work. And so I gave it to him. He was a friend of my family's, and asked him to judge it as if it were a professional piece, not as if he knew this, you know, nice 15-year-old boy who lived next door. And uh, he said, well, if you want me to judge it as a professional, and he'd read it, he said, then I have, to, I have to say it's the worst thing I ever read. And I was 
terribly upset because I thought I was going to be the first 15-year-old to have a show on Broadway, you know, <laughs> produced by Rogers. I just laid awake all night thinking, oh, oh, I'm going to be on Broadway in a year and I'm going to be 15 years old and I'm going to be on the cover of magazines. Oh, I had no idea this nice man who had been a sort of second father to me was going to tell me that the show was without any merit whatsoever. <laughs> but he did say, he said, it's, it's, it isn't that it's untalented. I think you're talented, but I'll tell you where it's wrong. And he started to go through it line by line from the very first stage direction to the last one, showing me what a play was, what characters were, what a song is, how you build a song, what it contributes to, to uh, an evening, how you keep an audience's attention, why they turn off, why they turn on. And it was just, in three or four hours, I got the distillation of a very successful and talented man's, what, 40 years of experience. It was all just oh. force-fed to me as if I was a Strasbourg goose. It was just crammed into me, and I've <laughs> never forgotten it. I can repeat everything he said that afternoon, and I, everything he said incidentally was true. He did not say a single thing that I disagree with. My style is entirely different than his, because one of the things he told me to do was not to imitate him. Because I started immediately to write songs about willows and larks and, and, and you know, a, a brand new state and, you know, what's the use of wandering and some enchanted evening, because that's what I thought, you know. But, now, he said, you don't believe any of that. You're, you, what you care about is the city and city life. I was born and brought up in New York City. Write what you feel. If you write what you feel, it'll come out true. If you write what I feel, it'll come out false. And, of course, he was right. What sage advice. So I just wrote oh. what I wanted to write. Critics have said the characters in your shows are often neurotic. Mm. Does, that make for a, does that make for a more interesting character? Yeah, I, um, I like neurotic people. I'm neurotic myself, and I like neurotic Everyone people. Everyone is, I think, to a degree. Well, that's exactly what I think. Everyone you see, is. I think it's universal. I think it's universal. Neurotic is one of those fashionable words that, that to some people means crazy. What it means is that everybody is troubled. Everybody has problems. And they're problems of circumstance, and they're problems that start when, when you're young and you're growing up, and they're, they're professional problems, and they're personal problems. Nobody goes through life unscathed. And I think if you write about those things, you're going to touch people. They're not always pleasant things to look at. And when people say it critically of my work, that, that deal with neurotic people, what they mean is it's not always so pleasant. But I do believe in the joy of life, and I, I am essentially an optimist. Not when I work. When, I'm, when I work, I'm, I'm saying, oh, this song isn't going to work, and that scene isn't going to work. And all that. But I really feel very strongly that people come out well. My f I, li I, I like friends who are troubled and where I can feel the trouble. I don't like people who conceal what they're feeling. And I write That's about people who conceal. Too. That's exactly. unhealthy, too. That's unhealthy to conceal what you're feeling. Because anybody who is totally smooth and totally nice, I don't trust. Nobody is totally smooth and totally nice. That, <laughs> unless they've lived in a hothouse all their life. <laughs> I, can, I can go outside. That's true. I can go outside on the street in a city like this and be just, you know, uh, all uh, beneficent towards everybody and be a saint. You can't. You can't. Somebody's going to yell at you. Somebody's going to jostle you. Somebody's going to beat you to the bus. Somebody's going to, you know, somebody's going to let the door slam in your face. I mean, uh, every, every human life. being is, is, is filled with anger and upset. And the fun of life is seeing how you can turn those things into good things. And I believe in writing about that. And I believe in, in, in sticking with people who are like that. Would you change anything about the way you work if you could? Yeah, I'm slow, and I'm, I'm slow not just because I take great care in what I write, but because I'm lazy, and that bothers me. <gasps> Stephen Sondheim is lazy? No, I am, I am. I, really, I haven't turned out enough work. I'm not lazy at the work. It's, it takes wild horses, you know. It's disgusting. You know, every time I see you in the street, I want to say, what are you doing here? Why aren't you home working? Mm, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's so wonderful that he should be working all the time. Talent like that should not be allowed. He shouldn't be, he should be sitting here, I think. I, one of the reasons... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, while I talk to Julie, why don't you write a song while I talk to Julie? <laughs> I can sharpen a pencil. I'm very good at sharpening pencils. There's a lot of sharpened pencils around that. I don't know. One of the reasons I like working with Harold Prince, with whom I've done oh. most of the, my recent shows, is he, is he knows exactly how to pressure me into writing. Because I don't respond well to a certain kind of bullying. But if I'm pushed just a little, but relentlessly, I get to work. And the shows I've written essentially are through the, the efforts of people like Hal Prince and Arthur Lawrence, the playwright, who also knows how to push. And, um, In a subtle way. Yeah, exactly. And I've done four shows with each of them. And that accounts for most of the shows I've done. What does the N stand for, Julie N. McKenzie? Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why you used only the addition on it. <laughs> does that bug you to have to tell why you have to do that? Oh, this? yes, it's very boring, really. Uh, my real name is Julia McKenzie, but um, I had to change it because there is an actress in America called Julia McKenzie. She probably hates me because I've come here and taken her name. <laughs> so I had to change it. Uh, the union made me change it. And um, I agreed to them letting me come over as Julie McKenzie, which I thought was the best of all possible worlds. And uh, when I came here, they got Julie N. McKenzie on, on, on the billboards. I couldn't change it. And I, 
My middle name is Nancy, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nancy. Uh, yes, I, uh, I, I'm stuck with it now. I, I'm thinking of running a competition to see if anyone can think of a better first name for me altogether and scrap the Julian. And I sympathize with you because when I got in this business, I had the same problem. My real name was Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy using it, so I... <laughs> More with Stephen Sondheim right after this. <laughs> Uh...